you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasounds some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. Uh, he's slightly intoxicated, you know, got his wrist pain by, by doing over-aggressive high fives to his buddies. <laughs> Okay, you're now one with the probe after last week, but you still don't completely understand how this magical thing works. So it's time to dive into the physics. We don't know anyone better able to give this talk than Mike Stone. You know how wicked smart he is. He's also able to make complex subjects very easy to understand. So you're going to hear a lot from him this month on physics. This talk is directly from our Ultron Leadership Academy that we just told you about last week. Actually, several of these upcoming talks are from the Academy. We think they're pretty well done, and we hope you agree. Now, we're working on some crazy advanced stuff for you, too, so relax. If you've had enough physics in the past, just chill. Some folks need this. We do care about you also, and we'll have some hot advanced stuff for you in the near future. But for now, physics. Take it away, Stone. If you're anything like me, you wonder why you need to learn ultrasound physics in the first place. I didn't come into an emergency ultrasound fellowship excited about physics, and I'll tell you I didn't leave excited about physics either. For some reason, I found myself in the position where people are always assigning me the physics talk, and it's kind of like a hot potato where nobody really wants to give it, and maybe the reason why I get assigned the physics talk is that I'm pretty shameless about saying I don't think you need to know that much physics to be able to be a good ultrasonographer. Now, it's important to know how to turn a machine on and operate it, and we'll cover all that stuff in a different module. How important is it to know details about frequency, period, wavelength, the Nyquist limit? I don't think it's terribly important at all. If you want to sit for an ultrasound exam and you're going to be tested on physics, you'll need to brush up on all of this stuff. And I can give you references that will prepare you perfectly adequately for these exams. From my perspective, I think it's important to know some very basic physics, at least so you can troubleshoot the machine if the image doesn't look the way you want, or maybe troubleshoot your image when you get into more complicated stuff like continuous wave Doppler, pulse wave Doppler, color Doppler. Um, I'm not going to go much further than that stuff, and we'll try and limit it to what I think is relevant, but let's get on with it. I promise that I will spend no more than one slide on the core principles of sound and how it behaves as a wave. So here we go. Here is my one slide of physics. Sound is a pressure wave, okay? It's a mechanical wave. It travels through tissue, through air, through water. If you were ever wondering, it doesn't travel in a vacuum, so it won't travel in space, although it does travel on the space station where it's used as the only form of diagnostic imaging. What do we need to know about sound? Well, we know it's a wave. So if we look at the way that a wave travels, it travels something like this. And just looking at this one wave, we can pretty much get all the detail that we need to know about very basic physics. First, the frequency. So the frequency is the number of cycles, and the cycle would go from here to there the number of cycles over a period of time. And in medical imaging, frequency is measured in hertz. And hertz is cycles per second. So human hearing, about 20 to 20,000 hertz, more or less. Ultrasound, anything above the range of human hearing. Diagnostic medical ultrasound, typically in the range of about 2 to 15 megahertz, a megahertz being a million hertz. So 2 to 15 capital M Hertz. That's the operating frequency of ultrasound in diagnostic medical use. Now the time it takes to go from the beginning of the cycle to the end of the cycle is known as the period. That will come up later when we do Doppler physics and we talk about pulse repetition periods. But right now, that's all you need to know. The period is the time from the beginning of the wave to the end of the wave, or the beginning of the cycle to the end of the cycle. Other terms that come up, wavelength, and this should be familiar from basic physics, but wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional. The wavelength is essentially the period. It's just measured in distance units instead of time units. So from the beginning of the wave or cycle to the end, if we measured that in millimeters or in meters, that is the wavelength. If we measured it in seconds or milliseconds, that's the period. So something with a long wavelength has a low frequency, and something with a short wavelength has a high frequency. And that's pretty much all you need to know about that. Why is it important? Well, 
a long wavelength will travel deeply into the body and will have low resolution because it's unable to discriminate tissues adjacent to each other as well as something with a short wavelength. So high frequency, short wavelength imaging penetrates shallowly and gives high resolution, whereas low frequency, long wavelength imaging penetrates deeply but gives poor resolution. So that's about all you need to know about frequency and wavelength for now. And lastly, in case we start talking about amplitude or power or intensity, all of which are just sort of measures of bigness of the ultrasound wave, the amplitude goes from here to here, unless you're talking about peak-to-peak -peak amplitude, which goes from there to there. I will not torture anyone any longer with physics, but hertz, cycle, cycles per second, we have an idea of what the frequency is, the period, the wavelength, the amplitude. Some of this will come up and almost exclusively in the setting of Doppler imaging, and we'll get to that stuff later. But consider that the introduction to physics. Speed is not about physics. This is more practical. Speed travels, um, oh, excuse me, ultrasound waves travel at different speeds through different tissues. And the number that gets batted around a bunch is 1540 meters per second. That's the speed of sound through soft tissue. It travels much more slowly through air or lung, so about 500. And it travels somewhere in the range of 3,000 through um, bone. Okay, so fastest through solids and slowest through air or gases and then in the mid-range for water and tissue. So because the ultrasound waves travel at different speeds through different tissues that have different acoustic impedances, that will affect the way that the sound waves bounce around, bend, reflect, and behave otherwise, which we'll see in some of the examples when we get into artifacts and artifacts in ultrasound imaging. Pulsed ultrasound, I mention only so you have an idea of what's actually happening inside the ultrasound transducer, where this is not a physics drawing, but I'm going to say, here's the sound wave. If, it, if the ultrasound machine pulses, meaning that an electrical current gets applied to the crystal and it sends out a sound, if this time is about one millisecond, the time from that pulse to the next pulse is about 999 milliseconds. So it's important to understand that most of the time the ultrasound transducer is listening for returning echoes. And we'll see how that impacts our imaging in artifacts and in normal imaging a little bit later. But short pulse, long listen, short pulse, long listen. That's the general principle of pulse waved ultrasound. All right, let's get into some more practical stuff with physics. The machine, because it sends out a pulse and then listens, determines how far away an object is based on how long it took for that pulse or echo to come back. So if this on top is an ultrasound transducer, and here's an object in the body, and over here is the ultrasound screen, when the ultrasound beam is turned on and starts to pulse sound, and this repeats over and over again, refreshes, which is why the images move dynamically, but we'll show you just one pulse and listen cycle. There goes the beam, it bounces off the structure, it comes back, and it took a really short time. So the machine represents that image close to the top of the screen. Also, from a practical standpoint, nomenclature-wise, for absolutely 99.9% .9 of the imaging you're doing with one or two rare exceptions. You're gonna have the probe and the screen oriented in a way where the top of the screen corresponds to the patient's skin and this is deep into the patient. That could be anterior, it could be posterior, it could be lateral, coronal, it just depends on which way the probe's positioned on the patient's body. But regardless, the top of the screen is gonna to correspond to the patient's skin. Now, as a result, the top half of the screen is referred to as the near field, and the bottom half of the screen is referred to as the far field. So just some nomenclature to be aware of, because you'll hear these terms pop up. So 
pulse comes out, strikes an object, returns back quickly, the machine represents that object on the screen in the near field because it didn't take a long time for that wave to come back and it assumes it must be close. Now contrast that if we move the object down and pulse. Now the pulse comes out and we're waiting and we're waiting and it comes back. And that long time of flight tells the machine that that object must be further away. And as a result, in this case, it gets displayed in the far field. Okay, so we know that time equals distance. We know that structures deep on the screen must be further away from the ultrasound probe, and that makes sense. Now, the only other real basic thing we need to understand about physics is what happens when that pulse strikes an object. And there's really three broad categories of what could happen. In this case, the pulse strikes an object. That object reflects almost all of the ultrasound waves back to the transducer. And as a result, the amplitude or the bigness of the returning waves is high. And because of that, there's a lot of returning echoes, and it is therefore a hyperechoic, lots of echoes, image that gets displayed. Hyperechoic is bright or echogenic. Those terms tend to be used interchangeably. And we'll see structures in the body that are echogenic have similar characteristics. So in the body, the things that are most commonly echogenic are things with high calcium scores. So here we have the scapula, and down here the proximal humerus in a patient with a glenohumeral dislocation. And over here we have a ureterovesicular junction ureteral calculus. So we're looking at bone being echogenic and stones being echogenic. The prior slide had gallstones, also echogenic. Um, tendons can have high echogenicity. Other structures will as well. But for the most part, if you remember that bones and stones are typically bright and shadow deep to them, which we'll cover in the artifact section, you'll be in pretty good shape. On the other end of the spectrum, what if the ultrasound wave comes out and passes directly through an object and doesn't get reflected at all back to the ultrasound transducer? Well, that's going to be devoid of echoes or anechoic, lacking echoes, and that's going to be black. So on this image, we're seeing, first of all, here are those gallstones that we pointed out on the echogenic spectrum, and then all of this black, which is bile, which is anechoic, and fluid on ultrasound is black. So anything that appears anechoic on ultrasound, truly anechoic, not dark, but black, is going to either be fluid or shadowing. And shadowing is usually pretty easy to identify, and we'll talk about that, like I mentioned, in the artifact section. So looking here, this is anechoic. We have on the left side of the screen a large abdominal aortic aneurysm that's about five by five. It's got a bunch of mural thrombus here, which is included appropriately in the measurements because that's all part of the aorta. But the lumen of the aorta over here is anechoic. It's containing black blood. Over here we have an ocular ultrasound with evidence of a retinal detachment but the bulk of the intraocular contents are black because we're looking at posterior chamber and we're looking at vitreous humor. So anechoic structures are black, whether that's urine, it's blood, it's bile, it's ocular contents. Anything that is fluid-filled will be black or anechoic on ultrasound. And lastly, the much more broad category is structures that reflect some of the ultrasound waves but allow some of them to transmit. And in those cases, you'll see some degree of gray. And how do you call a gray st what do you call a gray structure on ultrasound? Well, it it really depends about the surrounding structures. If it's brighter than the surrounding structures, it'll be hyperechoic with respect to them. If it's darker than the surrounding structures, it'll be hypoechoic with respect to those structures. It may be isoechoic, similarly echogenic. So that really is more of a relative term when you see some reflection and some transmission of ultrasound waves. What's hypoechoic or isoechoic or even hyperechoic, but not as hyperechoic as bone or stones? Um, typically solid organs, muscle, 
uh, those are the most common things. So here, um, we'll just do a little bit of practice. Take a look at the left side of the screen and think about how you would describe the structures there. So it's a kidney and there's some mild hydronephrosis. And if you were just to describe the contents of the renal pelvis within that circle, you'd be calling it anechoic. If you were to describe the lining of the renal pelvis, hopefully you're thinking that's hyperechoic. And then if you were going to describe the actual cortex of the kidney, that's hypoechoic with respect to the lining, which is bright. On the right side of the screen, we're looking at a dynamically placed, now static catheter within the internal jugular vein. Here's the carotid artery. Here's the internal jugular. That's the catheter tip right there. And overlying it is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And the sternocleidomastoid is hyperechoic with respect to the vein and the artery, but is hypoechoic with respect to the overlying fascia. So hopefully you're getting the hang of this. It's not so important that you describe every single structure in terms of its echogenicity, but if you're trying to describe abnormal findings or you're trying to describe findings to someone who you're doing an exam with and trying to instruct, it's really important that you speak the same language. So these are terms that you should just get used to hearing because they're going to pop up over and over again. That's really all the introduction to physics that you need at this point. We'll talk about how to operate the knobs on the ultrasound machine, some basic principles of scanning, and we'll cover some of the artifacts and other issues you'll encounter. And then we can move on to the fun stuff and get into actual clinical applications. Man, no one can spare my gray matter during a physics talk like Mike Stone. Now, if you're anything like me, you need to listen to this sort of stuff every once in a while, you know, in order to keep it fresh. Can't retain it if you don't use it, right? But don't worry, we've got more physics coming at you next week, so get some sleep, rest your medulla, and prepare for some artifact ultrasound. It's going to be awesome. not good enough at ultrasound that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation get out there ultrasound some hearts some lungs some ivcs let us know how you feel about it